All right. So with that, I'll, I'll get us started here. Um, thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Um, so glad to see so many people on and um, great to connect with all of you during this crazy time. Um, and we're, yeah, we're just really glad to be able to continue to offer some things like this so we can still uh, learn and um, see each other. And yeah, so I am I'm really grateful for you all being here and of course grateful for Matt that he's um, going to be teaching us today. So um, this is part of our American Indian and Alaska Native Prevention and Behavioral Health webinar series. We've combined these two today. Um, so uh, today this is um, going to be Matt Ignacio speaking on harm reduction and addressing implicit bias and stigma towards drug users. Uh, so just so you know, we're going to have, um, since this is a two-hour session, we'll have a short break, probably about five minutes, about halfway through. Um, uh, so uh, we'll have a chance to step away if you need to have a little break there. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Prevention Technology Transfer Center, as well as the Addiction Technology Transfer Center. Um, we're part of the ATTC and PTTC network, which also include 10 regional centers and network coordinating office and the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC and PTTC. In the next couple of days, we will send a follow-up email to everyone who attended, which will include a link to the recording, handouts of the slides, and a CEU request form. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and we'd be happy to provide you with CEUs for a $15 fee. Just so you know that um, usually your, your governing body who, um, who gives your licensure doesn't always require a, an official certificate. The um, email that uh, confirms your attendance is often good enough for, for that. So um, that's the only reason we charge a $15 fee is because then we have to create a certificate. For it. Uh, immediately following today's webinar, you will be redirected to our Gipper evaluation. This survey takes just a few minutes to complete and asks about your satisfaction with the event. And this feedback is critical to our future work, so we would greatly appreciate you taking your time and sharing your thoughts with us. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar, so please use the chat pod to share your questions and comments, and we'll address questions at appropriate points during the presentation. So Matt Ignacio is a doctoral candidate at the School of Social Work in, at the University of Washington. Matt also works for our ATTC and, and PTTC as a research support manager and has served as the lead author for the 2013 Center, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention funded publication titled Action, Compassion, and Healing, Working with Injection Drug Users in Native Communities. His prior work also includes the National American AIDS Prevention Center as project manager and the Michael Powell Center for AIDS Care and Support and Gay Men's Health Crisis, the first and largest AIDS services organization. So this uh, topic is very close to Matt's heart and his experience. And um, I'm really excited that he's gonna be sharing with us today. So um, I'm gonna pass things over to you at this time, Matt. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Kate. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Matt Ignacio, and I'm a member of the Thana Atta Nation. Um, just give me a little, if you can't hear me or if I need to turn up my volume, please use the chat box. That's a great way for us to uh, troubleshoot on our end. Um, I'm currently right now on the land of the Duwamish Nation, and this is the land of Chief Seattle and his people. And um, being here currently in graduate school in Seattle, um, I'm just about finishing up. Uh, I'm actually basically done. I just need to uh, type some loose ends and then defend my dissertation um, sometime in May. All things moving forward as planned in my head. Um, and then I will be moving on um, out of graduate school once I finish. So I'm very excited to be with you this morning. Um, I'm sending you positive energy, positive healing energy your way. Um, I made sure I blessed myself and smudged off this morning in preparation for this knowledge. And this is a great time for storytelling in a sense, right? So I'm very honored that you're taking time out of your day, whatever you're doing, to, to focus in on some information that can help not only our lives, but the people that I work close with and the people that we work for and with. <clears throat> yes, so 
Uh, this kind of just a brief kind of general overview. I have this discussion in two parts. Um, so for it's now 1007 in Seattle. Um, we will start part two at 11. So on the hour, um, wherever you, the next hour, wherever you are located and whatever time zone you're in, um, we'll have a little break for um, cute questions here and there. Um, we'll take questions at the end. And then if there's enough time, I'll, I'll make sure that we have enough time to have a little bathroom break or grab a snack or just stand up and stretch, um, take care of yourselves. And then we'll start back up on the hour. Um, so this first part is really kind of breaking down harm reduction. And you know, what is harm reduction or how does that apply to my life or why should I know about this? Um, you know, harm reduction evolves out of disease prevention. And so this topic is pretty timely considering uh, the world that we're living in today um, and the goal to prevent diseases um, to, in order to protect the people so the people can live. Okay, for this first part, I want to basically kind of give a brief, a broad stroke overview of drugs and alcohol, sort of a, a, a like a drugs and booze 101, if you will. Um, and then I want to kind of break down exactly the definition of what harm reduction is. And then I'll specifically look at, I'll close with some um, harm reduction intervention models, much of which um, some of you are already doing, um, but that it's, it's rooted in evidence-based interventions and that um, you know, we should acknowledge that as such. I just want to put a few disclaimers out there that uh, this presentation certainly does not attempt to speak on behalf of all Indigenous people and communities. Um, I am one person and I have had one experience um, on this journey. And so I'm just sharing you information that you probably already know. Many of you already know, but it bears repeating. Um, these are good reminders about how we conduct our work and, and, and the strategies and the values and the tools that we use to guide our work. And so I'm not speaking on behalf of all communities. I'm just speaking on behalf of my own experience. Um, and then I want to acknowledge that communities, whether you're from an urban community, whether you're from a reservation community, or what have you, a village in Alaska or a community in Hawaii, um, you know, there's communities have had diverse histories and experiences with historical trauma and ongoing contemporary traumas. And of course, you know, the the, the unfortunate outcomes and, and, this, and the disparity that results from trauma. And so I just want to honor communities today. I just want to name it and say it, that we are survivors, that we have been here and that we will continue to be here. And that it's important to remind not only us ourselves as providers, but also remind the people we work with and, and remind the communities that we work for. And also, you know, I just, you know, maybe not so much today, but certainly sometimes people might drop or, um, you know, share some sensitive information in the chat box or um, whatever the case may be. Um, conversations after this, you know, that you may have with your colleagues and your friends and your network. Um, but just be respectful of sensitive information. And this kind of ties in line with the whole, um, you know, confidentiality piece. And this is a little bit different. Yes, we want to uphold confidentiality with our clients and maintain the highest level of confidentiality so that we earn trust. Sensitive, sensitive information is sort of like, when people feel that trusting enough to share what's really going on, you know, that, that's a deeper level. And that's kind of where I hope we can kind of maybe direct our minds this morning. Let's get into that deeper level space. And uh, thank you for, again, for being with me this morning. Just so you have a sense of where I'm coming from, also, professionally speaking, um, I got a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of California in Santa Barbara. My very first job in HIV prevention was at Santa Barbara American and Indian Health and Services um, for our Red Ribbon program. And that work was 21 years ago. So I'm honored to have been part of the HIV movement, particularly serving um, American Indian, Alaskan Native and Native Hawaiian communities. And the bulk of that work took place when I worked for the National Native American Aid Prevention Center. Um, beyond that, have worked for the Harm Reduction Coalition in New York City, the immense health crisis, as Kate had mentioned, and then in 2008, I got a master's of ceremony. A master's of ceremony, oh, that's a new one. 
a master's of science in social work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, drugs and alcohol. So what is the definition of drugs? What is the definition of psychoactive drugs, right? Well, the definition is that it's any chemical substance, right? Any chemical substance that alters mood, behavior, perceptions, thoughts, consciousness, as a result of alterations in the functioning of the brain, otherwise known as your central nervous system, right? So it's any chemical substance that changes and alters these functions in the brain. And how that happens uh, is primarily through two ways, um, through pharmacokinetics, and that's how the body acts on the drugs, how it absorbs the drug, metabolizes the drug, it excretes the drug. And then there's also pharmacodynamics, which are the drug's direct influence on the brain. So there are you know, broad classifications of psychoactive drugs, and we'll walk through them on the next couple slides here. First being stimulants. And so some examples of stimulants in this classification of drugs include methamphetamine, cocaine, crack, caffeine, right? Caffeine is a drug, and nicotine. And the effects are that it increases alertness, endurance, productivity, motivation, increases arousal, heart rate, blood pressure. Certainly can alter the perception of much needed food, particularly for folks who are using uh, methamphetamine. Um, as well as hydration and sleep, those can all be disrupted. Um, in higher doses can certainly cause paranoia, heart attacks, strokes, overdose, and even death. Um, the next classification of drugs is looking at narcotics or opiates, uh, the sort of what we think of as pain relievers, and that includes heroin, oxycotton, oxycodone, morphine, Vicodin, and methadone. These drugs can certainly cause overdose, um, you know, which physically can cause constricted pupils, slow pulse, slow pulse, low blood pressure, and slow respiration. Um, mental functioning becomes clouded due to the depression of, this, of, the, of the brain functioning, the slowing down of the brain functioning. And you know, for folks who inject drugs, we're talking about issues like collapsed veins and, and track marks and scarring and um, the high risk for transmitting infectious diseases like HIV. Another classification of drugs is, are sedatives and hypnotics. So some examples of these uh, for prescription sleep are known as Ambien or Lunesta, and some other uh, some over-the-counter uh, sleeping pills that you, know, you might find at a local drugstore. Um, these can cause decreased activity, have a calming, relaxing effect, and reduce anxiety. However, at higher, and at higher doses, cause of sleep. Unfortunately, at higher doses, you know, there have been reports and you hear stories about, you know, people driving when they've taken their Ambien or people eating when they take their Ambien and they have no memory, you know, certainly can cause sleepwalking, driving, eating, um, can cause cognitive impairments and have short-term memory loss. And um, over time, you increase the tolerance so that the dose would have to be increased um, to achieve the desired effect, right? Um, Another classification of drugs are depressants, and this includes alcohol, benzodiazepines such as Xanax, Valium, and Ativan. Marijuana it can be included, um, and some inhalants, for example, uh, nitrous oxide. And what these drug classification of drugs do is that, is that it slows down the normal function of the brain, uh, slows down the pulse and breathing, increases drowsiness, um, lowered blood pressure, poor concentration, fatigue, and confusion. Um, as well as impaired coordination, memory, and judgment. And again, um, running the risk of increased tolerance, the need to use more in order to get the desired effect. Um, another classification of psychoactive drugs are hallucinogens. And this includes LSD, magic mushrooms, mescaline, um, otherwise known, or also known as peyote. Um, and these drugs alter perception of reality and cause halluc hallucinations and other alterations of the senses. Um, dilates pupils, elevates body temperature, increases heart rate and blood pressure, um, can also cause appetite loss, sleeplessness, tremors, headaches, nausea, sweating, heart palpitations, blurred vision, and memory loss. Um, I'm also just 
sort of as a side note, I'm reading these slides a little bit more literally just for folks who are uh, maybe calling in and doesn't have access to the visual. Um, just that's a side little note for everyone. Another cl classification of psychoactive drugs are enactogens, and this includes drugs like ecstasy, um, which can also include be a stimulant, hallucinogenic, have both of those properties, um, and can cause confusion, depression, sleep problems, severe anxiety, paranoia, um, muscle tension, involuntary teeth clenching, nausea, blurred vision, rapid eye movements, sweating, and increased arousal, heart rate, and heart increased heart rates, and blood pressure. Um, it seems that we have someone trying to uh, unable to download Adobe Connect. Um, they are more than welcome to call in if they'd like, and Kate will put that number in the chat box. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. All right. Um, another classification of drugs that are known as club drugs, you know, these sort of party drugs, right? So ketamine or Special K, uh, a drug known as GHB, um, gamma, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt this for you all, gamma hydroxybutate, right, by but, butyrate something like that, and rohypnol, otherwise known as a date rape drug. Um, dangers include everything from dehydration, acute memory loss, to coma, to death, right? Um, given that, you know, if you think, even just think about club drugs, I mean, how often are people just using one in, in the social or party situation? Um, I, uh, I, I certainly, yeah, uh, think of mixing drugs such as GHB with alcohol, you know, we know that that is a dangerous, dangerous, fatal um, concoction. Um, so, in other words, poly substance use, you know, think of when we talk about these classifications, think of them in context of using them multiple, multiple drug use, using multiple substances at, at a given time, right? You know, certainly does place the user at greater risk for drug harm. Another classification of psychoactive drugs are inhalants. So aerosols, you know, aerosol cans, gasoline, keyboard cleaner, um, and paints. What this drug does is suppresses the brain function. Uh, you know, it slows it down, can stop it, right? Certain chemicals can give the, the user similar feelings as alcohol and sedatives. And some ways we might, you know, we might see this out in our community. Um, you know, we might. There might be chemical odors on breath or on clothing for individuals. Um, you know, be, be mindful of pain or other stains on face, hands, or clothes. Um, this is coming from a prevention perspective. Um, you know, hidden empty spray paint or solvent cans, um, containers and chemically soaked rags or clothing. Um, you know, be mindful of the, of the damage that these drugs can, can do. And how available they are, right? Um, okay, so here's some images I have of, of drugs if you have not seen them. On the top left is a picture of ecstasy pills, different kinds of ecstasy pills. Um, then on the next, on the top right is a picture of a crack pipe with a little bit of um, Brillo pad as a filter and then the crack rock which is fake, uh, which is cooked cocaine um, with baking soda. And then in the bottom left is a picture of what I, I think is heroin, um, powdered heroin, and then larger um, imagery of the embossed ecstasy pills. And this photo shows on the top, um, way, uh, on the top left is a picture of methamphetamine, um, and then the two pictures on the right are both you know, ways it can be smoked, and then of course um, injecting drugs as well, whether it be methamphetamine, whether it be Opiates. I've heard in Indian communities in the past where folks were injecting alcohol. Um, yeah. So, also, it's really important to think about syringes and um, syringe access, given uh, the high rates of type two diabetes in our communities. And um, I know from. Uh, from the work I've done in the past, that there was a story of uh, a cohort of aunties, if you will, who lived in on the Pacific Coast um, in a tribe, small tribe, 
And what happened was that this cohort of antis, all these antis started turning up hep C positive. And they couldn't figure out why hep C was outbreaking in this particular group of the community. And it turned out that folks were taking the syringes of their diabetic relatives, using them, and then putting them back. So, you know, these are the dangers we run into when we don't make sterile injection equipment available. Um, you know, they have to use relatives, and that puts relatives in danger in direct harm. Um, when we talk about drug use, you know, I'm talking about drug use along a continuum, along a continuum of, of behavior. So from abstinence, you know, abstinence being an excellent form of harm reduction, right? Um, that's actually harm elimination, um, to experimental use, um, to ritual use. Um, think of maybe ceremonial use in this context. Um, intermittent use. So every so often, right? Um, maybe you are using um, socially for social use. You know, that might take place every weekend. Perhaps you are using for longer periods of time and, um, you know, drinking more per episode for longer periods of time. You know, you might be binge using. Um, then we talk about things such as abuse and dependence and severely and persistently chemically dependent. You know, these are marked by attempts to quit, um, failed attempt, not failed attempts to quit, but inability to, to not change your behavior and also continuing to use while you are now experiencing problems in other domains in your life, you know, your legal, your financial, your marital, your relationships. Um, one thing that we I don't we don't talk about I don't think as much or anymore as we used to um, is this idea of drug set and setting, and now these are all factors: the drug you take, the setting, the mindset in which you have, and the setting in which you do them all play a role in the overall effect. So you know the dose or the amount of the drug taken, right? What exactly are we talking about there? What drug specifically? Then we talk about the mindset or one, one, what one expects to feel. You know, going into a situation, maybe it's a Friday night, you know, you have a certain mindset that you want to have a good time. And then take into account the setting, the context, the environment in which all the, in which drugs are used. You know, again, these are primary factors in the overall effect. And the classic example um, is that you could be having a six pack of beer um, in the back of a limousine on your way to your best friend's wedding. Um, you know, that's, think of that sort of like scenario. And then also think about, you could be having a six pack of beer in the back of a limousine on your way to your best friend's funeral. You know, those are two different experiences. Um, and base, you know, which is my, the same drug, but two different outcomes, two different experiences, right? So it's important to just kind of think about these things when you talk about drug use. That these are factors that affect the overall effects. Um, we talked about this. Do, do, do. Um, with drug use, there are different modes of administration. So how we get take drugs into our system, right? There are different ways we could administer drugs into our system. One way we talked about earlier is through inhaling, huffing, whiffing, um, you know, aerosol paint, um, aerosol cans, you know, keyboard cleaner, um, nitrous oxide. We can also snort drugs such as cocaine and methamphetamine. Um, we can eat drugs such as ecstasy. Uh, we can smoke drugs such as cigarettes and marijuana. And there's also transdermal absorption. So think of like nicotine patches or um, you know, over-the-counter pain treatment patches that you can put on your muscles, you know, that absorb through the skin layers. And then also skin injecting. We can inject drugs through, through skin popping, um, which is, you know, inserting a needle directly under the skin we can inject drugs intravenously, which means directing drugs directly into our vein, or we can inject drugs intramuscularly. You know, we can 
we can shoot it, we can inject drugs through like our leg or our, our muscles, our muscle tissue. So um, that kind of leads us more into a little bit of injection drug use and sort of kind of, I'm building a case as to um, when we get to values, but this harm reduction part is part of you know, value-based work. And so when we're talking about injection drug use, um, I'm talking about injecting drugs using a syringe. Um, and the risk here is that trace amounts of blood can enter the syringe and remain in the barrel. If you think about injecting a drug, and the blood that gets trapped inside potentially is in an ideal environment for a virus such as HIV and hepatitis C, uh, and hepatitis B for that matter, to remain alive for a period of time largely because of the hermetic seal. So if a trace amount of blood gets inside of the barrel of a syringe and it lives in there, it's sealed off from the air. And one thing about HIV, um, that is not true about hepatitis C, and I'll get to that in one second. But one thing about HIV is that when it gets exposed to air, it's no longer a threat. The virus dies off. It can't live outside of the body. HIV cannot live outside of, um, outside of our bodies. And so that, that barrel, if there's trace amounts of blood inside that syringe, and then somebody else uses that syringe and injects drugs with it, the, the trace amounts of blood potentially had now been injected as well into the person that just used the same syringe. Um, hepatitis C is a little trickier because it can live outside the body. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but it can live outside of the body and for you know um, a period of time. So blood, blood, dried blood, blood on you know um, tourniquets or blood on syringes or blood on you know cookers or cleaners or spoons or what have you you know that there's risk there about acquiring hepatitis C. Okay, so I'm moving forward. So there are some specific harms when it comes to injecting drugs. Um, certainly dependency um, characterized by continued ongoing use despite the problems. We talked about that. Um, forgetting to take medications, certainly active users, whether they're injecting or not, may forget to take medications regularly. Um, and track marks, you know, injecting drugs directly into the vein can cause darkening of the veins due to scar scarring and toxin buildup. So here's an image I have of a, of, a, of a needle of a syringe. And the needle on the top left is brand new. The picture on the right is it's used once. You can already see in the very tip that it's kind of a little tiny bend. This is under a microscope, right? I believe it's enlarged six times. I don't remember how much it's enlarged, but on the bottom left, after it's used twice, you can really see the tip of that very fine needle bent. And then the needle used six times, you can see the damage. And if, imagine if you're using that in your arm repeatedly and the trauma that would cause to the tissue. You know, these, these dangers are real. Certainly stigma, right? We're gonna talk a little more about this in the next hour. But stigma and shame certainly can be experienced from strangers, families, friends, and coworkers. Furthermore, social service providers, us, you know, who all of us on this call, you know, healthcare providers, drug tre treatment providers, can also stigmatize folks who inject drugs. Inject drugs. Um, with regard to IDU harms, isolation, right, is another harm. Because of stigma and discrimination, folks who inject drugs are often in the visible population. Think about re the rejection, the marginalization, and the isolation from the larger community, um, which can ex exacerbate one's drug use and dependency, right? If you're isolated, which, you know, you've got to think about that today in this world we're living in now. Um, you know, and if, I'm so happy that Kate was, Kate and the ATTC are um, continuing on and trying to bring these opportunities so that we can come together to continue um, Kind of as best we can moving forward. Um, so that was a shout out to Kate. But getting back to the IDU harms, injection drug use harms, one thing that sort of kind of always rings in my mind is this um, idea around folks who inject drugs and they are compromising their cultural values, right? So in a traditional way, you know, using substances outside of a native ceremonial or religious purpose 
and I was very often viewed as bad and disrespectful. And so we, so those, so known users, so known drug users may not be welcome to participate in um, ceremony. And I, I always have to kind of take a pause here and say that, um, you know, I myself, my, this is where I'm speaking from my own experience, would support any traditional healer that would make their opportunities for healing um, for more than just people who don't use drugs. Like make it so that people who are suffering from addiction and substance use disorders can actually get treatment and help from traditional healers. Um, you know, this is more, I'm thinking on a community level stigma and how, you know, if, if you're struggling with addiction and medicine person or medicine people say, you know, we don't, we don't want to work with you, you know, you're practicing bad medicine, stay away. Well, how do you know then that that traditional medicine might not be the one thing to make change in the person's life for the better? And so I just would rather advocate for, um, you know, here's a, here's a direct stigma. Like, let's not stigmatize users in a healing setting. Um, and we can find ways to do that, I think. Okay, so let's break down harm reduction because we've been sort of dancing around it. Um, and I am mindful of the time. Oh, it's going by fast. I don't know about you. Um, I am on three cups of coffee, so maybe that's why. But let's talk about harm reduction a bit more in depth. So, addiction. Let's start with addiction. Uh, how do, what, what is addiction? How do we understand what addiction is today? You know, we hear the word addicts, we hear the word addiction. What is our understanding of addiction and where we are today? Well, you know, there are the underlying cause of addiction or chemical dependency or substance use disorders, what have you, is currently considered to be multifactorial, meaning that there are many factors involved rather than it be caused exclusively by one factor. You know, we've had other ways we've described addiction. There's been a moral theory explaining the cause of addiction. You know, this idea that good people don't use drugs, bad people use drugs. Um, you know, this informs policy. Create, let's create a war on drugs because we're so against, you know, this happening in our community. Um, there's been medical disease theories that have explained addiction. You know, that you might have heard, or I'm sure you've heard that addiction is, is a disease. Well, when you say that, you're working from a medical disease theory perspective. There are behavioral theories um, that explain addiction and that it is a learned behavior and or a social learned behavior. In other words, that, you know, if you grew up in a home where there was active, you know, alcoholism or drug addiction in your home, you know, that's a learned behavior. Or, you know, as a young, as a preteen or a early adolescent or an adolescent, uh, who gets mixed in with the wrong crowd, you know, you pick up, you know, some of their habits. That's a social learned behavior theory explaining addiction. That can explain addiction. And then there are neurological chemical imbalance theories that folks, you know, might often say self-medicating um, might use that term to describe that. But there have been a variety of ways that we've understood addiction, but today we understand it to be multifactorial. You know, there was a time when certain drugs that are legal today were perfectly legal over the counter. Here's a photo on the top left of actual cocaine tooth drops, um, instantaneous cure um, for sale, um, a vial of heroin. Um, Coca-Cola at one point actually contained cocaine, hence the name Coca-Cola. So that drugs, um, you know, have had a life of their own in a sense. They've had a journey of their own as far as how it's impacted our culture and impacted our lives. As I mentioned earlier, some historical approaches to addressing drug use, you know, the one, the, the sort of moral theory, is looking, locating the problem in the person, not the substance. So this, again, this moral approach, good people don't use drugs, right? Um, we're going to use a criminal justice model to rehabilitate. Um, you have to be abstinent in order to re-service it, receive our services, you know, demanding reduction, demanding abstinence. Or you are not a, you failed if you can't maintain abstinence, right? That's all kind of like 
putting the blame on the person themselves. We've also come from a perspective in the past where we've located the problem in the substance, not the person. Oh, so my, my other example of the war on drugs is more appropriately placed here. So we're finding the problem in the actual substance, not the person. Um, the war on drugs, supply and demand reduction in terms of the drugs crossing into our border. Think of border patrol efforts. Um, again, the criminal justice model can also be part of this approach. And what we're talking about here today is the harm reduction movement, in which, you know, given these past approaches, let's think about this in sort of a, let's recenter our thoughts on how we look at drug use. And the harm reduction movement says, or advocates for, locating the problem in the relationship, right? Locating the problem in the relationship between the person and the substance, which may change over time. So that's a sort of a different approach than kind of how things have been done in the past. And I will say that the harm reduction movement is not new. Uh, this is you know, on the shoulders of, of people who have fought not only in this country at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, in New York City, San Francisco, but in other countries as well. So harm reduction, by definition, is a perspective and a set of practical strategies to reduce the negative consequences of drug use, incorporating a spectrum of strategies from safer use to abstinence. So I think of it as like harm reduction is not, um, you know, any, anything goes that, we're, you know, we're just allowing everybody to use all the drugs they want and we're not, we're not concerned about their harm or their health. What harm reduction is really saying is, you know, meeting folks where they are, wherever they may be in their use, and helping, helping them to change some aspect of their behavior so that they reduce the harm in their lives. Um, and again, historically, one historical context, you know, the term harm reduction itself emerged out of public health policy in the Netherlands in um, the late 70s in Rotterdam. Um, because there was a hepatitis B outbreak and the public, the elected officials, the government officials um, enacted this public health policy of harm reduction as a way to stop the spread of hepatitis B among injection drug users in the city. So there are some values, there are some tenets of harm reduction and these are all from the Harm Reduction Coalition. First being that stopping drugs does not have to be the first goal of our intervention, right? When I work with somebody, them having to stop drugs does not have to be the first goal of our work together. Abstinence is an excellent form of harm reduction if the client wants to stop using. Many clients have not made a decision to stop or state they wish to continue to use drugs, but they still need help. Some folks are not able to stop, right? We know that. But we, as service providers, certainly need our clients where they are, not where we would like them to be. Part of harm reduction, working from a harm reduction approach, is that harm reduction ensures that drug users and those with a history of drug, drug use routinely have a real voice in the creation of programs and policies designed to serve them. Right? This is that cultural competency, if you will. That cultural relevance, designing our programs with cultural relevancy doesn't just mean to native culture, it also means to drug user culture, right? And an example at the end of this presentation, or at the end of one of these presentations that I'll circle back to and point out. Right? Um, affirms drug users themselves as the primary agents of reducing drug related harm and seeks to empower users themselves to share information and support each other in strategies to meet their actual needs. Harm reduction recognizes the realities of poverty, class, racism, social isolation, past trauma, sex-based, gender-based discrimination, and other social inequalities affect people's vulnerability to and capacity for effectively dealing with drug-related harm. By no means, 
this harm reduction attempt to minimize or ignore the real and tragic harm and dangers associated with drug use. Okay, I, for the sake of time, I'm going to keep pushing through. This is the last section of part one where we're going to talk about these intervention models, and what they, how, you know, what they look like on paper. So the first model, the classic harm reduction model, disease prevention, right? To reduce transmission, whether primary or secondary prevention, of bloodborne pathogens such as HIV or viral hepatitis. So we're working directly with folks to prevent getting infected, and we're helping folks to prevent reinfecting or um, you know, spreading the disease. Uh, that's, that's the main goal, is to stop the spread of diseases. And this harm reduction model, because that's the, sort of like the birthing ground of where this term came out of. We see this and we know this works, and it's actually the widely, the most widely um, researched, how do I want to say this? The, has demonstrated the most effective um, effectiveness in reducing HIV um, among injection drug users was syringe exchange, and it's most widely represented in the research literature. Um, so we know disease prevention models such as syringe exchange programs, um, syringe access programs, over-the-counter sales syringes at you know, pharmacies like Walgreens and Rite Aid, where you no longer need a prescription. You know, those are efforts to just to put this put the equipment out there in the community so the community can use it. Very much like condoms, right? That's another disease prevention intervention for sexual health risk. Making condoms available in high schools, at churches, at barbershops, you know, wherever the case may be, getting the technology out in the community so that folks can use it is, is the goal, to reduce the harm, right? Um, another model of harm reduction is harm elimination or abstinence, and the goal is to assist clients in achieving and maintaining abstinence. We see this in drug treatment programs, some abstinence-based housing programs, otherwise maybe known as dry housing, and some mental health programs. Another model, harm reduction model, is recovery readiness, and the goal here is to work with clients who are actively using alcohol and drugs and help them achieve abstinence or recovery in a particular time period. You know, very often it used to be from three to six months. You know, we might see this in damp housing programs and shelters, um, applied in mental health programs, addressing how drug use affects medication adherence. Um, another harm reduction model is moderation and controlled use strategies. And the goal with this model, this intervention, is to reduce the harm by reducing consumption or reduce or using, in other words, using less. Or controlling episodes or situations of use. So for example, using only on the weekends. Or it can also include switching how you put the drug into your body. So smoking a drug versus injecting um, has less risk than, you know, smoking a drug versus injecting carries less risk, immediate risk, right? Um, we see this applied in self-help support groups, um, alcohol-specific moderation intervention, um, known as moderation management, although I know I see literature out there now um, on uh, managed alcohol programs is another, that's a more current um, intervention out there. I was just reading about that. Um, moderation control use strategies could also be part of syringe service programs and some housing programs. Another harm reduction intervention, a classic example is substitution therapy, right? And the goal here is to replace one drug with a higher associated risk with another drug of lower risk. So for example, on the street, heroin isn't quality controlled. You don't know what it's cut with. It could have fentanyl, car fentanyl, it could have whatever in it, right? Versus medication-assisted treatment um, is prescribed by a trained medical provider. And so you know that it isn't containing anything. Such as, uh, uh, such a, you know, it isn't, it isn't, uh, what's the word, laced, you know, when they talk about drugs being laced. Um, we see this in sort of warm turkey approaches. Instead of going cold turkey, you know, warm turkey related to nicotine replacement strategies, patches, and nicotine enhanced chewing gum. Um, yes. The next model, harm reduction model, is relapse prevention. And the goal of this model is to prevent return, prevent a return to drug use following a period of successful abstinence. 
we see this in drug treatment programs, both outpatient as well as inpatient. And the goal here really is to understand high-risk behaviors and high-risk situations that would potentially lead to uh, relapse. Another classic harm reduction intervention that you know, we are seeing across the country in the last three years um, is you know, addressing overdose prevention, particularly as it relates to opiates. But overdose prevention has been a long, um, I would say, fought, I don't want to say battle, but um, challenge to get to the mainstream level. And unfortunately, it took more deaths to get there, but we now have a national response. And the goal for overdose prevention efforts are to prevent death and negative health consequences, right? Ending up in the ER or ending up wherever. You know? um, applied in syringe service programs. Um, you can train users in Narcan. You can train providers how to administer Narcan, um, Narcan naloxone. Um, drug, it's also applied in drug treatment programs. Um, part of relapse prevention strategies in pre-release programs for jails and prisons. Um, think about folks who may have been inside a facility and you know, incarcerated for a period of time and they are not using in jail, but then they get out, and they you know, may want to get high and they use an opiate on the street and it's laced or contaminated with something that they don't know. But even if it's not, their tolerance has already been altered because they've been away from the drug. They haven't had access to the drug, so their tolerance is lower. So thinking you can get back out on the street and use the same amount could be fatal. And that's that, that little bit of education is part of um, the package of what we talk about in overdose prevention. Um, and another harm reduction model that um, was, has been embraced early on is this sort of alternative approaches. Um, and that is sort of ancillary or you know these sort of extra supportive services to active and former drug users um, so think of things like acupuncture programs for detox and relapse uh, massage therapy reiki nutrition information um, i have this word alternative in quotes because this is kind of where we fit in in terms of the cultural side of things like i've seen this done in, in states uh, or in other parts of the country where, you know, this is where the, the beating group, the cultural groups emerge, the beating groups, the drumming groups, um, as interventions to, to disseminate health information. So in other words, um, I'm gonna give a shout out to the state of Florida. Um, Florida Health Department, gosh, probably a decade ago, maybe, maybe a little less than that, uh, based on some community feedback and some community guidance and some community support they came up with an intervention called the shawl making group and what it was the state of florida um, provided some funding for this what it was was a group of native women to come together for a period of uh, 10 weeks or eight weeks and over the course of the time they would not only make shawls but they would also receive health information on breast and cervical cancer as well as hiv and so these alternative approaches really are not alternative to me. They're more, these are, these are like our bread and butter as far as um, being we as a new people. Um, but, you know, I just want to kind of, it has to be included because this is, this is, what, this is where we do our work a lot of the times, is trying to connect evidence-based work with sort of the community work. Well, here's one way we can kind of word that craftedly, like craft a, intervention around alternative approaches using harm reduction in the form of a beating group or a drum making group or some kind of group or community event where um, folks come together and then also learn a little bit about some health topic. Um, you know, moving forward, we're gonna to have to get creative on how we achieve these sorts of interactions, but I have full faith that we can do it find a way. And lastly, the classic harm reduction model, right? Another classic harm reduction model. Education, and the goal here is to prevent drug-related harm. Increases awareness of harm and drug use through educational forums, such as drinking and driving campaigns, binge drinking reduction strategies. When I worked for the Harm Reduction Coalition um, in the early 2000s, we had a series of pamphlets that were bold in, in design, 
were about the size of a you know a CD you know CD jewel case if you can remember those, and it had a big letter C, and underneath it said C for cocaine, and there was H for heroin, and there was like you know, and 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 it gave honest information about the benefits of using cocaine and the harms and dangers of using cocaine, and that was um, using the harm reduction model of education giving balanced information to individuals so then they can make an informed decision whether or not to use, right? That's what I mean by education. Okay, here's a poster, a copy of a poster that we did for hepatitis C prevention. At the bottom, it read in big red letters, hepatitis C, it's all about the blood. And in this photo, in this poster, it's sort of illustrating, dick, uh, dick, depicting where you know the potential risks and harm are for you know likely hepatitis C transmission, the cooker, the blood on the tourniquet, you know the blood in the, in the water, you know things that you might want to consider in terms of uh, get use your own equipment. In other words, don't share is what really kind of the bottom messages of this of this poster. Okay, great, I made it through seven minutes to spare. Um, before we move on now to kind of putting all this harm reduction sort of theory into practice and into work by addressing bias and stigma, by addressing our own, our very own implicit bias and stigma um, towards people who use drugs, as well as addressing community uh, and organizational bias and stigma. We'll talk about that on the hour, but I, I'll take a minute or two now if there's any um, pressing questions, and then just know that when we pause, we will start back up sharply on the hour. Thanks. Okay, I have a few questions here. Good to see all of y'all from everywhere. Good to see you. There's some people from Akimadal, some country, my relatives. Okay, Aaron Dixon has a question. Does anybody know of any prison or jail system that actually does harm reduction for relapse? They don't even want condoms in jails or prisons. Yep, I, that's a very common experience. I'd like to know if other people are able to do outreach into jails. I know that it, um, when I was living in New York City, we were invited by Rikers Island um, for their once a month, you know, relapse or no, their their pre-release community health event, and we would all kind of line up in a row at our tables, and we were allowed to hand out information, but we couldn't necessarily interact with inmates. Anyway, all right. So that's Aaron. Just uh, Aaron, if anyone has any experience work doing harm reduction work in jails or prisons, that's a great question. Um, uh, thinking about for adolescents or adults, um, Cedra responded, Aaron says, I haven't heard of any county or fed that provides harm reduction. Alicia shares that we love our shirt, uh, our shirt, shirt and skirt sewing group for our intensive outreach treatment program and the drawing group for our community at NACC in Minnesota. We also had a medicine pouch event for our MAT clients. Great for healing. Absolutely. Good job. That sounds awesome. Cedra says, no, I haven't heard of harm reduction use in court order treatment for adults. Patrick Kaff looking um, how, to co how to incorporate traditional culture into these modalities. We're going to talk about that next. We're going to talk about how to incorporate traditional culture into these modalities. Um, that's a great question, Patrick. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that all, all, in the next hour. Um, one thing Sandra says, one thing I have seen our counselor use is a medical model sharing information on how addiction works. Yeah, absolutely. Explaining addiction as, as how it relates to the changes in your brain. When you take drugs, these changes happen in your brain and therefore this is why you're experiencing this, this, and this. That is absolutely critical education that is needed. Good job. Okay, I'm going to give everyone a break. Keep typing if you're typing. Um, we'll come back in five minutes. Um, and yeah, we'll see you then.
Okay. I am going to get started. You are just joining us. Thank you for taking time out of your morning. We are about ready to start part two. We just had a discussion or a presentation um, on harm reduction and sort of kind of looking at harm reduction um, really as a, as, a, as, a, as a public health movement, as a public health approach to how we work with drug users. Um, and, and kind of explaining the history behind it and sort of different interventions that have classically been used in the HIV movement and uh, the hepatitis C awareness movement, absolutely, and advocating for drug users, injection drug user needs. You know, this work has been, um, you know, I, I think back to um, just people early in the fight, early that I got to work with when I was in New York City, who were first in the front lines of HIV and um, learning from them and, and learning, learning from people who were the first to initiate support groups for injection drug users on the Lower East Side in the mid 80s um, because they were losing all their friends to AIDS. So having the opportunity to be mentored by folks like that um, I feel um, has prepared me to, to navigate these discussions around how do we address biases, how do we address stigma um, towards people who use drugs. And so that's where we are now. Um, again, if you have any questions or the audio is a little off or you can't hear me, please feel free to use the chat box um, and we'll go from there. All right, so for this next part, this last part, I want to talk about values, and I want to talk about our value systems. Um, then I want to talk about, you know, creating safe healing environments. Um, and then we can talk about strategies to addressing individual, organizational, and community level stigma. All right, so let's talk about value systems for a bit, a bit here. So think about, I want everyone to think about, you know, close your eyes if you want. Um, just take a few moments to take a breath in. Exhale out. Everybody take a breath in. Take a breath out. Come on, last, take a breath in for healing. And take a breath out. Release all the toxins. And I want you to think about the values that you use to guide your everyday work. What values get you out of bed each morning to show up to the job that you have or to attend the school that you're enrolled in? What values do you have as a parent that inform the way you shape the lives of your children. Now, what value systems do you rely on when things go haywire? <laughs> when there's a middle of a crisis, you know, what value systems are you relying on to get through these challenges? It's kind of where I want to begin is thinking about these values that guide our lives. So understanding our values, um, certainly understand the values that guide our work, certainly keep us grounded and they keep us focused, right? They help, these values can help create a foundation for all of our relationships, both at work and at home and other people that we interact with. Your values certainly, again, are important because we can fall back on them when we encounter challenges. And when we're thinking of our values, you know, we can explore our values typically on three levels, right? So we think of external factors that have contributed to our values. So our parents, the way we were raised or not raised, right? Our families, the friends that we had growing up, the media that we were exposed to um, and that we are ongoing exposed to. These are all in, you know, informing our value systems. We have personal experiences. So, for example, our first sexual encounter, the first time we experimented with drugs, 
we've had any histories of abuse and assault um, and you know, help shape our attitude about what's acceptable and what's not. You know, these are different levels on which we can explore our values. A third level is you know, our obligations as providers. You know, that can include our organizational goals, our deliverables, our objectives, right? Excuse me. Our mission statements, our policies and procedure manual, our job role, our titles, the expectations connected to our to our to our jobs. You know, those can all those inform our values and how we do the work. But I would say, um, you know, as for native populations, uh, for native providers, uh, and if you're non-native working with native community, right? There's this fourth level of values that come into play that's critically important. And that's the role of cultural and traditional values um, that every community has, right? In the research literature, it's referred to as our original instructions. Um, and so this fourth level is the role of cultural and traditional values that are inherent and part of our existence, right? These original instructions are tribal specific code of values and ethics. These traditional values are grounded in our collective experience and they are evidence-based. Our traditional values are a divine gift. They were given to us and they're rooted in our spirituality. And these values across, you know, intertribally uh, inform on how to live in balance with the universe, right? So that there's these cultural and traditional values that shape the way we do our work. For example, in my own um, my own nation, in the Dana Atta nation, um, we have a word that sums this up, and that's called himbak. Um, so if you, I was saying about somebody, a relative, you know, if I were saying it in English, I would say, oh, yeah, he practices real good himbak, or, or they're really in touch with their himbak, or they raise their kids um, really traditionally with himbak. And Hembak actually is the way the our lo our, the local tribal colleges organize their education system. It guides the way they run the school. And they have defined it as um, the Thana Atam Hembak consists of the culture, the way of life, and values that are uniquely held and displayed by the Thana Atam people. Hembak incorporates everything in life that makes us unique as individuals and as a people. It is a lifelong journey, and this includes things as arts, basketry, community, games, beliefs, harvesting, seasons, relatives, family, mobility, song, storytelling, sensitivity, and values. Right, so this is an example of the, the, the traditional value systems that's kind of on this fourth level in the way we, the, the kind of values that guide our life and guide, guide our work. And so how does this all kind of intersect with harm reduction, right? So how I've kind of thought about this is, you know, this indigenous, this native value um, to guide harm reduction work. And the first thing that comes to mind is this value, this cultural value of respecting all life. And when we talk about someone who uses drugs or injects drugs, that's someone's mother, father, sister, daughter, son, friend. That's your relative, right? We can be effective helpers when we set aside our own judgments and see the person for who they are, right? a human being. And where this intersects with harm reduction practice is that very often you see in harm reduction work that we meet clients where they're at or that we provide non-judgmental services. That's respecting all life. That's valuing all life. And that's kind of how I've um, connected the two. Another way I've bridged sort of native values and harm reduction is this value I grew up around giving back by sharing what we know. And as native people, we have a responsibility to educate ourselves and share that information with those in our family and community. Um, so I use the example of you get to go to a conference or you get to go to a meeting or maybe by some sure stroke of luck, you just take a little bit of today's knowledge and you share it with a coworker or a friend or a family member. Um, that's giving back by sharing what we know. It's being grateful for learning something new and wanting to share that with people in our circle. And that can look like in harm reduction work, 
labeled as education and outreach, right? And the third way I've sort of blended native values and harm reduction is this value I grew up with, is this cultural value of helping others. Um, like anytime there was a family gathering or a ceremony or a feast day or what have you, um, you know, guess who was in the kitchen scrubbing giant pots of like burnt beans, you know, for 16 hours a day, you know, that's, and it was expected of me as a young kid, and then you just know to jump in there and help because the work is so, um, requires a lot of manpower or person power. And so that value of helping others, you know, same thing with harm reduction. People who use drugs, injection drug users, certainly can be stigmatized, judged, vilified, vilified, demonized, and ignored. Yet they are part of our family, they are part of our circle, so it's our responsibility to care for and help our own people, including those who inject and use drugs. And how that gets played out in the harm reduction world, in the harm reduction literature and practice, you know, you hear about compassionate responses to drug users, developing compassionate strategies and responses um, to reduce drug-related harm. I lied, there's a fourth one. This cultural value of compassion defined as to suffer together. Compassion is the feeling you have when you're witnessing someone suffering and you feel motivated to help. Similar to empathy, um, where empathy is the ability to understand someone suffering from their perspective, compassion includes a desire to help. And that's a distinction. So, kind of tying it all together, sort of harm reduction values and cultural values, native cultural values. When we educate ourselves on the health needs of those who use drugs and we respond compassionately, I believe we're honoring our traditions and sharing what we know, helping others and respecting our lives. So let's talk about now creating safe healing environments. So we as providers, we play a supportive role. We work from what is known as a strengths-based perspective. Um, this is, in, this, uh, as opposed to working from a deficit model perspective. Um, a deficit model perspective locates the problem within the individual, um, is quick to find the problem, um, doesn't take into account the client's environment, skill sets, or knowledge, or access to. Um, working, you know, in contrast, working from a strengths-based perspective, you're recognizing that the client showed up for their appointment, or the client is motivated and wants to, um, the client is motivated and wants to address some aspect of their life, and so they come in and see you. That's a, that's a high level of motivation and that's a strength and you want to if it were me i would name it i have no problem naming something good when i see my clients hey it's really awesome to see you i'm glad you followed through and came in for your appointment you know that's a, that takes strength i mean i think that's exactly what i would say to somebody who came in for their appointment after you know that, that follow through that they they're demonstrating that they are wanting to to embark on the work it doesn't mean that people who don't show up don't want to embark on the work. It just means that this person that got out of bed to show up and be there, that's a strength and you're just naming it on. We as providers, you know, you know, playing a supportive role, we also um, work from a client-centered approach. And what that means is that the client's needs are met and not ours. That can, can be kind of difficult when we think of timelines and our deliverables and our funding structures when we have three months left of a grant period and we have to do nine months of work. Um, you know, this is something you have to kind of be able to navigate, but, but you always want to work on the side of what are the client's needs. You know, when we design drop-in hours for clients um, in the afternoons from two to five, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and no one shows up, 
you know, are we scheduling those hours just because it meets staff's availability or does that actually meet the needs of the client? You know, so working from a client-centered approach. Also, including playing a supportive role, um, we strive to provide services that are culturally affirming. Moving beyond this idea of cultural competency, I don't know how many of you have um, ever attended, you know, in the 90s or what have you, uh, a cultural competency training. And, um, you know, I, I would suggest moving beyond that terminology just because it's, you can't ever become competent excuse me, in somebody else's culture. It just is not um, a realistic goal to achieve. Rather, working from a cultural humility perspective, um, which is an approach that emerged out of the nursing profession as a way to uh, correct the power imbalances between a doctor and a patient, right? Um, in other words, how do you have good bedside manner? How can you relate more with your patient? How can you increase trust with your patient? How can you get patients to adhere? You know, these are all tactics. And one tactic is to work from a culturally affirming perspective. Um, to have that cultural humility that learning is a lifelong journey, um, that I make mistakes, but I pick myself up and I move forward. Um, it's just sort of having an openness and willingness to learn. Cultural affirming services also include a holistic approach. So not just treating the body, but the mind, the spirit, the soul, the mind, body, and emotions. Um, and you want to create services that are inclusive of spiritual and traditional and cultural needs, which I think we are improving upon every day, given where we've been. Yes, and our funders and equally policymakers might believe that it is our job to empower individuals to be able to manage their own care, therefore to reduce the need for ongoing supportive services. While that might be a goal, we have to consider um, indigenous people in this country's experience uh, with regard to history and the historical traumas around boarding school and institutions and um, native sanitarium, you know, sanitariums that were used as a weapon. Um, so what I'm saying is that it's, it's almost like, again, you have to be able to navigate. In one ear, you're hearing, you got to do it the way we're paying you, we're giving you the money to do it. And then on the other you're hearing, there's a culturally relevant way to do the work. And your job is sort of like in the middle to make it happen, to satisfy both ends. At least that's how I see my job. Um, yes, I receive federal funding to do work, to deliver trainings, but it's the community that tells me what the training topic is and what they want to hear. Sort of like, Feds give, or the funding agencies give money, but I take direction from community, if that makes sense. And that's a way to redress power, right? Given, given the historical way Native people have been um, treated, the power should be in the people's hands, right? What do the Native people want to hear? How can I best be helpful? You know, that's playing a supportive role. That's also a client-centered client approach. Um, you know, being mindful that Native people living with addiction may have had little or no experience navigating systems, wait lists, fees, et cetera. That's very challenging. There are always ongoing, well, not shouldn't say always, but there very much likely are issues of stigma, shame, fear, perhaps homophobia. Um, uh, for whatever party, you know, these, these can be a hindrance. Um, and that can leave clients asking, where do I even begin if they're not feeling safe or they don't feel like the organization they're going into, they're going to be treated kindly or fairly. Um, you know, where do I even begin if you are struggling with addiction? You know, this is the life of our, of, our, of our community. This can result in the individual shutting down. And when then we have a lost population of Native people living with addiction who are disenfranchised at every level. 
living without health care, finding systems threatening, remaining stuck, feeling hopeless, continuing to use, ultimately leading to loss of life. Certainly, we do not want that to happen. So, I have some strategies on how we can address this on an individual level, on an organizational level, and then on a community level. How am I doing for time? Okay, great. All right, so thinking of this from a Native context, communities may harbor negative judgment towards people who use drugs. We as service providers may have negative judgments and biases that are both personal and professional. Individually, we might feel embarrassed, angry, frustrated, and hopeless when thinking about the negative impact substance use has had on our people. And as a result, we may choose to ignore the reality of the situation. I want you to think about this reflection. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this slide. Go ahead and close your eyes, and I want you to think about this with regard to changing our behaviors. And learning how to learning a new skill, right? Okay, I'm gonna read it. At the top it says reflection. Most of us did not learn how to ride a bike the first time we attempted to. It required support, practice, and patience. As we learned how to ride the bike on our own, we accepted the fact that we may fall down. Learning how to pick ourselves back up and having the courage and strength to try again is part of the process of learning new skills and behaviors. You can open your eyes now. I share this because we need to be reminded, and I know this information is not new for, for, for some of you, and I, I, that's intentional, and maybe this information is new for some of you. Maybe you're newer on the job, and that's intentional as well. This, I wanted to share these messages because they, need, they bear reminding, and you can never hear them enough. That learning a new skill such as how to not turn to drugs and alcohol takes tremendous courage and strength. And if we can't relate to that, think about you trying to learn a new skill, like riding a bike, and the challenges and the fears that you had. I can think back to learning how to ride a bike and being fearful when it went too fast, even though it wasn't even going that fast, or being fearful when my dad would let go of the back seat, you know, and I was riding on my own. Those are real feelings. And I'm just calling in for us to remember that it's not easy to make change and to just to honor the process. And really celebrate folks that want to make change. From an individual approach, um, working, working with clients, it's important that a trusting connection be established. Trust building, you know, this personal connection builds the therapeutic relationship. It is important to take time to establish a connection before any of the work can get done. Um, uh, the, uh, the, think about like um, your intake process. I had a great example of a, a community that, uh, our provider, a native provider, who does individual level work, but um, already allows and bills for the first seven sessions to be part of the intake process. So, I mean, that's kind of her own decolonized approach to mental health services. Rather than session one, the first 40 minutes, be the session dedicated to getting to know you, um, this provider breaks up the billing and allows it to, you know, is a, is, is a, and, and it kind of makes room for the client so that there isn't so treatment focused. It's allowing time for that relationship to be built and be established. Building that trust is, is a cornerstone of our practice. Working from a non judgmental perspective, right? There's sort of setting aside this right versus wrong, right? This moral, we talked about this moral approach in harm or in, in addressing. Uh, drugs, drug and alcohol, 
um, you know, the, this moral approach that good people don't use drugs or, you know, that you're, you're ruining your life or I, you know, I, an example of how this came up in one time with an audience member when I was delivering this information. She came up to me and said, I, um, uh, you know, my client keeps referring to themselves as a junkie. Oh, I'm just a junkie, you know, kind of comically, but introduces themselves as a junkie. And this client is very, very involved in their health and wants to make changes, but still kind of carries this name as a junkie. And the woman asked, you know, what should, is that right? You know, should I be supportive of that? And I thought about it, and you might have your own approach on how you might handle this, but I was thinking around the lines of like, well, I don't, you know, I don't know if that's a healthy approach. I don't know if we should support somebody who labels themselves as a junkie, given all the loaded baggage that that term carries with it through the years of, oh, they're just a junkie on heroin or a junkie on the street, you know, really sort of putting, labeling themselves. And, and, I, and so when we carry that sort of, and my point is this, as providers, when we use those terminology, when we use those words and we have these conversations about clients, we have these discussions in the back room and we use words like that, we're still kind of participating in judgmental work. And we need to work from a non-judgmental approach. In other words, we don't talk badly about clients, right? We don't judge our clients. Um, as in addition to, you know, we strive to work from and have equal partnerships. I very often will say, I, I, in this context, I'll even say, I am not the expert. You all are the experts. You all know the communities you're working with. You all know the trends that are happening in your community with regard to drugs and drug use. Um, you know, the same thing with our clients. They are the experts in their life. They are the experts of their use. And so my goal is to always to work from a place of like, we're equal partners. Partners here. Um, I think that could be helpful. Knowing that for our clients, um, that change is an incremental, invisible, lifelong process. When you know their goals are being set, being supportive and celebrating small successes are critical elements to behavior change. I believe. So again, somebody. Um, you know, when I was working at my desk at GMHC in New York, providing individual level counseling to a caseload of 25 um, gay and bisexual men who wanted to address some aspect of their drug use, um, the phone would ring and it would be a client. And then a week later or whatever, day later, whenever the session was scheduled, the client shows up, wow, right there, the fact, the fact that they picked up the phone and the fact that they showed up, those are not small successes that should be celebrated. Those are, in my mind, huge successes that should be celebrated. I, you know how long it takes me to pick up the phone and schedule a teeth cleaning? I mean, months can go by. So think of the time people think about maybe picking up the phone. The same thing is true with your clients. They are thinking about picking up the phone or reaching out for help, but by the time they actually do and they're ready to do it, that's a success that should be celebrated, I believe. And certainly for our clients, acknowledging that relapses or slips or um, getting off track or returning back to, to past behaviors um, are part of the change process. They're part of the change process. They're part of the journey forward. Okay. So, from a community response, from a community perspective, community respect perspective, thinking about you know collectively how we as providers cope with difficult events. Um, I think as we examine how we cope, we strengthen our ability to be present. Self awareness is self care. Um, I know this might seem like an odd way. Let me look at the next slide real quick. Yeah. Okay. So. You know, it's we are individual providers, but we are situated within a community, and both are equally important. 
How we can be present in community is by being in touch with ourselves. And I know that sounds very new agey, but I will give you an example of how that plays out. The very top of this hour, as we got on the slide, whatever it was, slide two or three, we did a quick breathing exercise that was really impromptu. But by us collectively taking breaths and by me taking the breaths, I was able to recenter and focus on the content of the slide. That was kind of like side note, really what I was trying to do. <laughs> you didn't know that, but I was trying to get myself centered into the, into the work for the next hour, you know? But I was also using it as an opportunity for all of us to get situated and centered in this work right now. That's one way we can be responsive and present in community is by doing that initial work first. Uh, you know, there used to be a saying, you know, on the job and we would say things to people like, um, leave, leave home at home. When you come to work, leave home at, when you cross the threshold at your job, leave home at home. And when you leave work at 5 p.m., you leave work at work. That's kind of similar, another way of looking at it is being present in the task at the moment is going to be the foundation for you to be present in community. We also want to acknowledge that community has so many strengths. Um, we, we know in the literature that you can, you can read about the, the, the myriad of disparities that American Alaska Native people experience, whether it be suicide, depression, alcoholism, what have you. Like that information is out there, but what is not talked about enough to my liking are the strengths sort of, yes, there are those realities, there are those disparities, but there is also the other side of the coin, which doesn't get talked about enough. And that is community strengths, our ability to self-determine our destiny, our spirituality, our connection to higher power, connection to creator, our connection to the plants, to the land, to the water, to the four-legged relatives, to the winged relatives, connection with our past and our elders, our cultural pride. I mean, these are all strengths that are going to lift us up and keep us, keep us sustained. Part of working from a community approach is getting users involved. And we talked about this in the last presentation a little bit. You know, getting users involved in the planning, the mobilizing, and the implementation of services is critical for success. Programs must reflect the values, customs, and social norms of the target populations. So again, in other words, programs must strive for drug user, and in this context, native-specific cultural relevancy. Um, let me see, community approach. Okay, there's a question here. Um, from Lori, um, Roman Horace, thank you, Lori. Um, any way we can help the people we serve with love, compassion, um, we'll always draw them. They themselves know what they are struggling with, and at times their self-esteem is so low, they need to know how important they are. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. Absolutely, um, this idea that people, people know that what they're doing is maybe not the healthiest thing to be doing. Um, I know very clearly when I go for that second piece of cake at 10 o'clock at night, I know exactly the damages I'm doing potentially to my body, right? But we do it anyway. And yeah, maybe I'm having a bad day. Maybe I am struggling. Um, and so I think, your, Lori, your point is right on the money when it talks about um, we need to let people know just how important they are. And we need to be able to, you know, express love and compassion more so than ever, more so than ever now, moving forward. Okay, thank you for the comment. All right, let's talk about working, creating safe healing environments from an organizational approach. Mm. Um, excuse me, all this talking has got me swallowing all this air here. Um, that's how you know I'm getting excited. Uh, okay, looking at this from an organizational approach, um, and I am mindful of the time. Organizations we stri that strive to provide services, you know, we hope that are, again, culturally affirming beyond this idea of cultural competency, again, holistic needs, I think I might have already said this, inclusive of spiritual needs. 
excuse me. One thing that we could do, you know, I, I talk about this regularly. Uh, as a provider, or as in this sense, an organization, if an organization wants to get, out, get in on this, um, <laughs> I'm just catching my breath, um, that, you know, maybe consider supplying nutritionist snacks, keeping in mind of the high rates of diabetes. Um, so like bags of apples on site or oranges that you can distribute, you know, a couple here or there to each client protein bars, you know, I've gone to the dollar store and brought granola bars and kept them in my desk drawer for folks who may, might have needed an extra snack. I mean, you don't know. You don't know what people are going through. So um, this might, you know, the snack you offer might be the only nutritious snack of that person's day. And if you aren't able to do that, you know, at the very, very least, I hope you can keep a glass that you can wash and reuse and sanitize, but at least you can offer a glass of water to the person. And I'm not framing that as like, well, as a last ditch effort or like the last option on the menu, but actually probably I should move that to the front because water is life. Water is medicine. And my father would say things like, um, uh, that you wanna, this is in the context of when we have family over for dinner. And he would say, he said to me one time, um, you know, you you just want to keep, keep uh, how did he phrase it? You want to just, um, you want to attend to their creature comforts. That's what he said. And so that's what I say to you all. You just want to attend to your client's creature comforts, you know, getting a chair for them to sit in and making sure noises are eliminated as much as possible creating that safe healing environment by setting, offering a glass of water and you don't ask, you just offer and you set it down. You know, those kinds of ways or um, strategies are how we can sort of create healing environments for our clients. Um, and in, in the past, I know syringe exchange programs uh, you know, kind of were very good at this, um, partnering with local health food stores, um, coffee shops that not only supported syringe exchange, um, but also, they had a tax write-off for in-kind donations of their day-old pastries and baked goods. And so I know Starbucks in Denver was partnering with the local syringe exchange there in making this happen. So it's sort of this win-win-win situation. Um, you know, we certainly want to advertise and support, you know, their, 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 their help, you know, on printed materials and website and give them gratitude for sure. Um, again, from our organizational approach, some other strategies we might want to use are um, for staff that travel, you know, explicitly have them collect hotel shamp shampoos and soaps and create an organizational like storage for all this. And so that when folks come in who might need a shower or marginally housed or on the streets, you know, you can give them little hygiene kits that include hotel shampoos and soaps. You can encourage socks to bring in clean pairs of socks, again, from the dollar store. We run a closed sock drive, or a sock drive or a closed drive, and then have that on hand for distribution. You can include a clean pair of socks with your hygiene kits. And above, I mean, above all else, you, you also should be equally as focused on documenting what's been done. You never know when you could collect enough information to then suddenly turn it into a proposal, and then next thing you know, you've got money coming out of your ear to then implement an actual program. And it can be very basic, documenting you know, what you received, what you distributed, and any feedback, positive or negative. And that could be a baseline in terms of data collection. There is this idea around incentives. Um, you know, if your organization has funding or your program has opportunities to provide incentives. For example, they used to offer um, they used to offer, you know, you know, to get an HIV test at a local IHS clinic, you could come in and get a $10 gas card or a $10 Walmart card to get an HIV test. You know, this, this idea of incentives. And the research literature speaks to this relationship between the provider and the client regarding incentives. And the question is, is the client seeking services only for the incentives? Or is the client personally motivated 
and the incentive is just sort of this extra benefit. I mean, and from my own practice experience, as long as the client is returning for services, it doesn't matter what their motivation is. You have a golden opportunity to, opportunity to engage and build trust with them. So if incentives are what get some people in the door, if um, having evening hours are what get other people in the door, if um, offering drop-in hours are what get other people in the door, I mean, you wanna offer a buffet of options and if one of those options is a $10 gas card every time you come in, regardless of why they're coming in, you have that opportunity to build that relationship, to build that trust, and that's so key and critical. Your organization could use any one of these days and events as a way to, 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 to create a local, easy, low threshold event to raise awareness. You could, in May, organize a Hepatitis Awareness Month event um, you know, have a talk, have a, have a community feed, a community discussion. Um, during May 11th and 15th, you could host a needle disposal week event. May 19th, you could have a national hepatitis testing day event. Same with July 28th being World Hepatitis Day. And you'll know a lot of community-based organizations organize on August 31st uh, memorials for International Overdose Awareness Day. These are all strategies and ways not only to raise awareness, but share education information and also engage in community in the work that we're all trying to accomplish. Again, another win-win-win situation. We know um, as organizations, um, we know that targeted messaging is a strength, right? Respectfully including our imagery in, in, in community-specific brochures, in public service announcements on the radio, flyers and posters, is a great way to get attention. So I had an example, I mentioned an example earlier. This was an example of with community input, as well as um, a poster that was meant, that was designed to, to hang in um, waiting rooms of community-based clinics and health centers. And the, po the poster reads, titled in big font, user-friendly. And at the bottom it says, we know our patients who use alcohol, drugs, and cigarettes value their health. Our goal is to provide every patient the best medical care we can. We're here to help you, not judge you. Now imagine if you were sitting in your IHS clinic or a checkup and you see that poster, I mean, imagine what the thoughts that might be running through your head. If it were me and I see this in the waiting room, um, and I do access um, IHS for my primary medical care at Seattle Indian Health, uh, Seattle, Urban, Seattle Indian Health Center, <laughs> Seattle Indian Health Board, my dad. But let's imagine I'm sitting in a, an environment where I'm in a, a native health center and I see this poster. poster. That speaks volumes. That speaks a lot of volumes about the kind of people that are delivering the care that I'm going to receive. And it kind of says that, you know, it communicates to me that the organization is, is, is really cares about me as a person and my health. Doesn't focus on the choices I make as a person, but wants to see me healthy. And I think that's an important perspective to have that we can all learn from. And this is, this is an example, and these are examples that you can use and adapt for your own community. There's no reason why you can't literally take the same, t same text and, and create an image that's, rel that's localized to you and reflective of your own community. Um, I'm sure the Harm Reduction Coalition would, would love a shout out, but you know, you can adapt this in your own language and communicate the same mes message in different ways. All right, creating uh, creating um, healthy environments, you know, has us is comes from a solution focused approach. That uh, prevention services uh, are services for active users utilizes this positive service delivery model in which that we aim to convey authentic interest. You know, um, folks might use mindfulness as a way to be present. In, in the moment, I very often use take three deep breaths at the beginning of teaching a class or 
delivering a one hour webinar. Um, but, you know, finding a way so that you get in your most, most authentic self. Um, might be saying a prayer, might be saying the Lord's Prayer. However, what it, you know, know what that is. And if you don't know, that's a great place for self-discovery and self-awareness. Um, part of working from a positive service delivery model is that frontline providers, you all have this perspective that is golden with regard to advocacy. Because you're on the front line, you can advocate up. Because you know what drugs are being used in the community, you know what harms and risks are taking place, you know the dangers that are happening in real time. That level of advocacy is so crucial, crucially needed, and it's needed and directed upwards, up the chain. Right? It's part of it's part of holding that balance that I talked about, about answering to the needs of community while sort of responding to the funders that pay for the work. Um, that advocacy piece is like is how you advocating to the funders that pay for the work based on what the community said is kind of basically how I see uh, I see how well how I've operationalized um, my career. And again, acknowledging and providing supportive words of encouragement for positive steps that have already been made like scheduling that appointment, like following through, like coming in for the second appointment, like coming back for that test result. I mean, all those are really um, opportunities to celebrate and to acknowledge. Okay, so in closing, um, our strength is our future. I really believe that. And in my experience, it takes just one person and you might be just that one person or your client who's really active and involved in the community. It might be just that one person. But many communities experience limited resources time and time again. It is that one person, the lone champion who stands up and makes reducing drug related harm and drug use a priority for their community. So I'll read you a quote. I'll close with this. This is from a colleague. Um, Antonia from Akimut Altham, and when, when she was out in LA at the time, and I wanted her to talk a little bit about what we've been talking about over the last two hours. And so this is what Antonia said, with regard to that one champion, that one lone person, right? Okay. Antonia says. Antonia says. There have been many success stories within our native community, with many clients being able to maintain and commit themselves to a sober lifestyle. The connection clients have with other clients who demonstrate care and concern for them, along with their involvement in 12-step programs, as well as religious and cultural activities, help bring meaning to a new life. There is one person that stands out in our community, a woman who for years used intravenously and reconnected with traditional ceremonies, and today facilitates a monthly women's talking circle and has worked diligently to obtain her associate's degree for drug and alcohol counseling and education. This woman is a positive role model for other Native women in the Los Angeles community. She demonstrates her strong beliefs of helping others and giving back. Sapo, thank you so very much for taking time out of your day to be with me to join us in this discussion around harm reduction and bias. And please feel free to reach out and know that I support you in this work. Know that I'm praying for you all and praying for all of our communities, Native and non-Native. Wonderful, um, thank you so much, you Matt. Um, it's yeah, so great to hear you. all of your, your tips and um, ideas for how to show uh, care and support to um, those we're working with. So Um, Kate, are you there? All right, we have a few questions. I'll go ahead and take them now. Um, Shannon says, a trauma therapist told me that snacks and a beverage are trauma-informed care. Absolutely, right? There's a quick way as we can build a relationship and connection to somebody. Um, you're welcome, Teresa. 
Roger asks, would you say culture and humility could be asking client what they value most in their culture? Absolutely. Culture and humility is all about learning. Um, the way I think this could play out is like if you're, for example, let's say you're non-native and you're working with somebody who is native. You might spend a few moments before you meet that individual and look up their tribal history, know where their lands are, maybe understand a thing about too about their health system. And then when you get face to face, you know, share a little bit about you and how you got to where you are and why you are doing the work you're doing and sort of have this mutual give and take. It's not self-disclosure. You're building a relationship of getting to know one getting to know one another. And that could be a step by step by step process that could take years. And so asking somebody, you know, what do you value most? Tell me something that you value about your culture, or tell me something interesting about your culture or where you come from. Those are excellent ways to, to begin that relationship building. Um, I hope that helps, Roger. Let's see what else we got. Um, any tips or suggestions for encouraging cultural humility um, versus cultural competency with non-native medical providers during care collaboration for patients in NAT or dosing programs? Um, cultural humility, I mean, I mean, medical providers who are administering MAT um, may have not been involved in the harm reduction work, right? These are providers who are sort of new to this scene and may have never heard of anything that we just talked about in the last two hours in their medical training. Uh, medical providers like doctors, I think, may go to 12 years of college but only take one semester of drugs and alcohol. Um, so it's a training issue to me right out the gate. You know, we at the APTC, you know, provide trainings like this in the hopes that providers get on and can learn and expand their knowledge. So any tips, uh, you know, certainly training, reach out, feel free to reach out to Kate or myself. Um, you know, we'd be happy to have a conversation moving forward, um, particularly as it relates to the travel of your response. Recipients. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. No, thank you all. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you're welcome, uh, everybody. This was the best webinar. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, any suggestions for users who want to go cold turkey? Um, they value their independence. Well. I mean, not knowing anything about um, this situation, any suggestions for users who want to go cold turkey? And, I mean, not knowing what drug they're using, um, you know, it is possible. It is possible it, when, in what they refer to in the medical model, um, spontaneous remission. It is possible for people to make that change. And it happens all the time. And you know, I would start with hope, encouraging and supporting a message of hope and, and planting Matt, that seed of hope. Matt, I have a follow-up question to that, actually. You never know. Oh. You never know. Um, okay, um, you guys are too sweet and too kind. Um, it's really my pleasure and honor to be here with you all. Can you hear me okay? I'm going to turn it over to Kate in case Kate has anything else. Can, pe can people hear me? I a, sorry, I just want to make sure because I think it looks like people are typing yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, jumped in there a second ago and I wasn't sure if you could hear me. So it uh, sounds like you can. Thank you. Um, yes, I just want to comment to Matt. Maybe Matt can't hear me. I hope I portrayed um, love, care, and hope. I'm glad you got that. Um, I love and care and hope for you all. Okay. Um, let me try one other thing. All right. Kate, are you on the call? I mean, I see you're on, but are you able to speak? Yes, I can. Need to acknowledge real harm and risk while also being strengths based and harm reduction based. Um, 
Well, I mean, I think of I think of Narcan um, or training people how to do rescue breathing. I mean, those are harm reduction based interventions, and you're not and you're not you're not communicating uh, that you know if you keep using drugs, you're going to overdose and die. You might frame it as if you're going to use opiates, you know, you run the risk of overdose. And not to mention, if you're using with friends, they may overdose. So this is a life-saving life skill to know. Um, you know, you're acknowledging the real harm that someone may die, but you're framing it as a skill set to save you and your friends' lives, right? If that's helpful. Um, Matt can't hear me. Okay, so Kay, you are talking and I can't hear you. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me now, Matt? Hello, Matt? Um, okay, I think, I think others can hear me. Um, so I, I just wanted to say um, thank you to Matt, and I, even though he can't hear me. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who has joined us. I'll, I'll try to make sure Matt um, knows what's going on, even if he can't hear me. But, uh, um, I, yeah, thank you to all of you for being on. Oh, Matt can't hear me. Great. Um, <laughs> sorry for the confusion. Um, but no, I can hear I, you. I, can. I, I really appreciate all of your. Okay. Um, I really appreciate all the interactions and questions and every um, everybody participating. So thank you for that. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, close out for today. And um, just want to make sure you all, yeah, like Matt said, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you have my email and the announcements that get sent out um, if you have any other questions about this. But um, watch for those announcements. We'll be sending out invitations for more webinars we might be doing even more than normal, um, given that we're all stuck at home these days, so watch for that.